hiking around out in the desert, you might see these little piles of dirt all over the place. And a lot of time what that is, is this guy here. The Scolopendra centipede. Now, even this guy has to burrow into the ground to get away from the heat of the sun. Also, if he stays up here, he'll get eaten by ants, birds, and other reptiles. As he looks like a tasty little morsel. So he's an arthropod, he has the exoskeleton, he needs to get under the ground before he gets too hot and overheats. So you can see he's using all his legs there, he's digging his hole, he's going to dig it out and burrow down about a foot or two. He's running to an ant nest. burrowed straight into an ant's nest and of course the ants aren't happy to see him either so he's out of there he's gonna have to find himself another area to go to dig another hole then at night time they come out particularly after it rains as well so if you're out camping when it's raining a uh, good idea to hang your boots up get up off the ground if you can or be in a swag that has a zip up zip up fly net you don't want one of these guys in your swag or your bed. Uh, bit of a nasty bite, not very nice venom, can make you a little bit sick, maybe a little nauseous, maybe a little gangrenous if untreated. So keep an eye out for these guys. This one's only a small one. They do get fairly large and as you might have seen in some of my previous episodes, you get some bigger ones in uh, Southeast Asia and parts of the jungles. This is something you don't see every day. This is one of Australia's most venomous snakes, Western Brown. We've come across him and he's actually choked on a mouse, which is really bizarre. Now there are about nine different color phases. This one's got 14 incomplete bands around him. They can be black, they can be light colored. They can have a black head, like a black headed python. They can have a really light colored head as well. In the hotter summer months, if he wants to warm up quicker, he'll have a darker coloration. This guy's actually choked on a mouse, which is really bizarre, and I thought I just had to, uh, had to film this really bizarre occasion. So, uh, two things have happened here. He's either, he's either just choked on it and couldn't regurgitate it in time, or at the end of the trachea, when snakes swallow their prey, they push their trachea out of their mouth and at the end of the trachea is a little glotus. It's a little valve which they breathe through. So he's either choked on it, he couldn't get his trachea out of his mouth, or maybe the mouse has bitten it, but who really knows? Typical characteristic with these brown snakes also with the, the Easterns and the Westerns are the orange blotches on the belly there also. And he's got more of a yellow marking around his face. Now I've also obviously got to be careful handling this snake, even though he's dead, if my finger went inside his mouth and one of those fangs just scratched the surface of my skin, he could still quite easily envenomate me. And a bite from one of these snakes is potentially fatal without the right treatment. Who would have thought I'd seen the day where I saw a little mouse take out one of our most venomous snakes in Australia? Bizarre.
Okay, here we are cruising on the Kinabatan River. We're in Sabah, Borneo. We're on this wildlife adventure to see what awesome animals we can find along the way. This is the second longest river in Borneo. It snakes 560 kilometers out to the Sulu Sea. These rainforest areas are some of the last strongholds for the awesome animals that live on Borneo. Clouded leopards, sun bears, orangutans, proboscis monkeys, another five or six different species of monkey, including macaques and uh, languas. And then we've also got some big crocodiles in here as well. Some giant monitor lizards. And who knows what else we're gonna find. Theosaurus, the cloaked lizard also known as the frill neck lizard or the frilly to Australia and some of the southern parts of New Guinea found right across northern Australia, Queensland, Northern Territory, WA. It's one of the largest species of the agama lizards or dragon lizards and he's got this cool frill which frills right out around his neck attached to the jawline. He has cartilage strands going down and when he frills up He'll erect that frill to 90 degrees right around his head, up to 30 centimetres. And that'll make him look big and scary. Now you can see they're a semi-arboreal dragon. These guys get to 85 to 90 centimetres. He's got long, sharp claws. Good for climbing, good for digging holes, good for running fast. They're bipedal, they'll run on their back legs, also known as a bicycle lizard. You can see that external ear just behind his eye there a bit further. So they can hear quite well. The frill is now laid back along his body and it adds to his camouflage. So they're very cryptic lizards, they're very sneaky. If you walk around one side of the tree, he'll shuffle around to the other side to evade detection. And they come out in the wet season and they breed. The females lay 12 to 14 eggs and they'll dig a hole and they'll hide the eggs down in that hole and cover it over. About two to three months later, the little frillies will hatch out and they'll usually head straight up the trees. They're also born with the frill and they look just like their parents. This time of the year in the wet season, they'll come down off their trees, establish territories. They'll fight other males and they'll keep their territory. They'll also communicate to each other doing head bobs, waving hands, push-ups, other signals. One of the largest species of dragons in Australia, this guy and the Eastern water dragon. Yes, one of Australia's most iconic species. See you buddy, enjoy your wet season and your breeding. Let's go and see what else we can find. Lizard, awesome. He's he's all camouflage, all closed up on that branch there. Now 
when a predator or something comes too close, he'll flare that frill out. That's where he gets his name. The frill goes right around the head. Not like the bearded dragon. It's the frill neck goes right around. So he frills that frill out really, really big and scary. And he's got little fangs and little beetle crunching jaws. And what they do is they sit up here on their little lookout podiums and they watch out on the ground for anything that might be moving around and they'll jump down and they'll eat it for dinner. So he's from the Agama family. He's one of our largest uh, dragon lizards from the Agama family. He gets to 90 centimeters total length, probably ooh, about this big. Uh, and the water dragon as well, they get to about 90 centimeters. So he's one of the largest dragon lizards in Australia. If I come around this side, you might look at the camera a little bit. And then you can see he's very good. He focuses on the movement, he sees what's going on just sit up here and he'll camouflage so what happens is when I move away he'll either go back into camouflage mode or what he'll do is he'll run down and hide somewhere else oh check this bloke out the lung cutter lung cutter blue tongue hello how you doing got a little stumpy tail haven't you hey see him huffing and puffing making himself look big Big and scary. Get away or I'll bite ya. Poor old blue tongues. A lot of them unfortunately in Australia get mistaken for snakes. Because they got little short stumpy legs. But this is the Centrillion Desert Blue Tongue. And they're about another five subspecies. There's a southern one, a northern one, western one. And this is the desert one. Lungkata in Pitanjara. He's got a stumpy tail, probably got in a fight. Yeah. He's healed up all right. He's having a little bit of a hiss. And he's got that blue tongue they stick out. <coughs> that blue tongue that he sticks out, a bit like a moldy. <coughs> Get away, I'm scary. So they're omnivorous, they'll eat flowers and succulents, they'll also take little bits of fruit and local mineral and anuli, uh, bush plums, and they like snails as well, so they're good to have around your garden because they eat snails and slugs. And these guys give birth to live young baby blue tongues, they're really cute when they're small, about this big. He's just out here getting a bit of sun heating up for the day and of course he's a solar powered reptile. Just coming into spring now so all the animals are starting to wake up. A little beauty. We're just out doing a bit of spotlight and I've come across this little beastie here. Have a look at this ripper. He's a tetagonid. There are 6,400 described species and they're made up of katydids and bush crickets and this is a carnivorous katydid. This guy will actually use stridulation by rubbing body parts together to put out a call and she'll attract cicadas. The cicada will come along thinking they're going to find a mate and meet their doom. This guy will grab hold of them using the spikes on the forelimbs there and have them for dinner. So this one is insectivorous and the other species will eat fruits. They'll also eat seeds and leaf matter. This one's a female, you can see on the back there it looks like a long stinger. That's actually an oviposter and that's what the females use for egg placement. So they'll stick them down into the dirt or into rotten wood or even into, into tree matter and they'll lay their eggs in there. So it mainly comes out at night. They've got little hooks and little, suck, uh, little sticky pads on their feet. They're quite good climbers and of course those big wings there they can fly quite well as well. Bit of a creepy crawly but another cool central western nocturnal beastie of the desert okay here we are all of us on another wildlife adventure in the toilet believe it or not even in the toilet here you might find something when you go for a flush dun, 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 That's Kermit the Bog. He lives in the bogger. Uh, good spot for him. Nice and cool. Lots of fresh water. 
leave the lid open. And he comes out at night and eats all the huntsman spiders and all the other creepy crawlies that we don't want in our bathrooms. Kind of cool. Oh, how cool is that? The mating call of the male toke gecko. Also the territorial call. Let's all the other geckos know this is my turf. I've got some girls here. Stay away. But awesome noise right through Southeast Asia. You can hear it. And uh, they're great to have around your bungalow, particularly because they're eating all of the big creepy crawlies that live in there. Buddy, awesome night. We're just cruising around out in the desert. See what species are out. We found this little guy here. He's a little banded burrowing snake and they're mainly nocturnal and during the hot parts of the day will bury into the ground. A little bit of a shovel nose shape snout there. So we're just cruising around tonight seeing what sort of uh, nocturnal wildlife is out. It is summertime and we've just had a light sprinkle of rain so we're hoping we can find some other crawlies as well. Some, some more reptiles and some Scorpions and spiders and centipedes would be pretty cool to see as well. But yeah, beautiful little snake. Something you don't see very often. Alrighty, so we're going to feed one of our Woma pythons now. And uh, he looks like he's hungry. Boom, so he's grabbed onto that, he's constricting it. We'll give him a little bit of a fight, then we'll release him.
fingers on the camera. Boom! Got him. Boom! Right on cue. And there they are. Happy little kids. Awesome, look at that, the largest species of varanid in Australia. The Parenti gets to 2.5 metres long. Now Australia's got 27 species, which is over half of the world's population of monitor lizards, or goannas is another name for them. And of course, the largest lizard in the world is also from the monitor family, is the awesome Komodo dragon. But this guy here is the largest one in Australia, and he's an absolute beauty. Now these ones actually love to eat brown snakes and black snakes, so they're kind of good to have around. Keep the venomous snakes population and our rodent populations down as well. Now this is what goannas love, old rabbit holes. They even love them more when they're occupied. If the goanna goes down here, and there's little baby rabbits in there. Guess what's for breakfast? So European rabbit, introduced species to Australia. Dug lots of holes everywhere, but the wildlife take advantage of this. Also, snakes will go down there to escape the heat of the day. So this goanna likes this area, likes all these different holes. When it gets too hot during the day, we'll hide down in here. In the mornings, come out, bask, get nice and warm, optimum temperature above 30 degrees, then we'll go out hunting. Then when it gets too hot, we we'll go back under the ground, maybe come out in the late afternoon. So this sort of area, we'll set up somewhere over here and see if we can't get him coming out and going on a bit of a hunt. about a one meter parenti nungtaka eating a rabbit kitten medium sized one probably about a 700 gram rabbit so this goanna monitor lizard he's caught that rabbit and killed it and now he's basically chewed it in half and he's trying to swallow down the back end of the rabbit so I think once he gets that piece off eventually He'll look at swallowing the front half. You can see obviously he's got a mouthful there. His skin stretched around his throat is quite tight. They do have razor sharp teeth and they can obviously slice through that rabbit skin as well. But he'll have to swallow that part first and then chew through that bit of fur left over before it actually comes completely in half. So he's trying to rub that rabbit against the rock to help try and tear it in half. Got some visitors. What are you guys doing out here? Hey? What's going on? What's going on out here? Hmm? One, two, three, four. Are you guys waiting for the next episode of Awesome Animals TV? Is that what's going on? I think they're waiting for the next episode. Are you here for the talent? The casting call? Huh? Are you here for the casting? Yeah? You guys want to be on YouTube? 
Maybe? Up top there, yes? No? I think they're here for the YouTube casting. Well, we will have to make an episode about you cockies. Yes. So, sulfur crested cockatoos. That's what we call you guys. And the cool thing about the sulfur crested cockatoos is they live for over a hundred years. You're gonna live for a long time. Bird's gonna outlive me. It's probably older than me already. Hey mate. They're just chilling up here, certain parts of northern Australia. Cockies are a bit like those guys up there. Seagulls. Don't tell them I said that. They're pretty clever as well. They can have a vocabulary of over a dozen words. So, they're quite good at mimicking and talking. Hello. Hello, cocky. And this guy here is a male. The male of the cockatoo species has a really dark eye. And the females will have a red eye or a lighter coloured eye. We can see this guy's got a really dark eye. Hey mate, you've got a dark eye, haven't you? Hey, what are your mates doing up there? Hey? You guys out for trouble? Looking for trouble, aren't you? <laughs> Hey, what's that? That camera. It's a camera. Can you eat it? No, you can't eat the camera. What's going on up there? The mohawk's out. Pretty awesome, the old cockatoos. So, they live all around Australia in different areas. And they particularly love the big gum trees of a hollow log in the gum tree and that's where they'll nest in the nesting season once a year around spring and they lay one to two eggs usually hey a couple eggs and they probably will mate for life as well if they can do you get the feeling you're being watched Just chilling. G'day Vegemites and welcome back to Awesome Animals TV. Thanks for joining us once again. At the moment we're in the Northern Territory. It's Mango Madness Silly Season November, also known as the build up and everything here is going full troppo, including all of the animals. So we're out tonight looking to see what's out and about. Let's go and see what we can find. Cane toads originally from South America. The ones that were introduced to Australia were introduced from Hawaii to combat the cane beetle. Now the cane beetle lives up in the cane and the cane toad is a terrestrial species so it was a bit of a blunder to introduce an animal that is not semi-arboreal to combat an arboreal pest and it proved to not be successful at all. However, the cane toad proved to be a successful survivor and has covered a third of Australia and has been devastating to our native wildlife. There we go, that's something you don't see every day, an amphibian going to the toilet. That's probably what's left of a lot of bugs. And anything else that moves out here then he can catch and swallow, he will. So the new scientific Latin name for the cane toad is Rhinella marina. This one's a female, you can see she's a bit darker. They can live up to five years, and in that time, a mature female can produce over 200,000 eggs. And they take about a year, a year and a half, to sexually mature. 
So the male cane toad, when he's calling for a mate, the noise that he makes is a It's kind of a long purring noise, so if you hear that around your property, you know that that is a cane toad. Hey buddy, that's right. You can see all the little bumps as well, which distinguishes it's the male. Lots of little bumps. So you can really see the paratoid glands on the back of his neck there, either side. And that excretes his neurotoxin, which can be fatal for lots of animals. Basically it causes paralysis. You see the cane toads posture, they sit up really high. And that's how you can tell the difference between a frog and a toad on the road. A toad sits up really high. The frogs are generally laying flatter and most of the time up here they'll be green. That's where the saying comes from. Let's hit the frog and toad, let's hit the road. Interesting thing as well with frogs and toads is a lot of them actually have horizontal pupils. Most nocturnal animals have vertical pupils or elliptical pupils. Diurnal or daytime animals, mammals like us, we have round pupils. Horizontal pupils is, uh, is not common in many species from the animal kingdom. Some of the predators that have proved successful in Australia against the cane toad are the keelback snake, which is immune to their venom. Crows have learnt to flip them over and pick out their innards. Also Victor lawnmowers, and also a lot of Australians combat cane toads with a nine iron, which is pretty sad. The most humane way to dispose them off your property if you don't want them there is to put them in a bag and put them in a freezer and they just go to sleep. They're also looking at ways to turn cane toads into fertilizer in Australia. You can really see the paratoid glands, the venom glands on the side there. They look like big jaw muscles. You also notice the posture of the toad. They sit up nice and high, whereas frogs are generally flat. When he sits up high like that, that enables him to scan around the area and see any movement. 